This week, the Luxury Channel takes to the sky in some of the world's most spectacular private jets. I believe that over time, we will all move around the planet in a very different way. Selling planes to rich people is more fun than rock and roll. This is rock and roll for grown-ups. I love flying in these planes. We're flying 27, 28,000 feet. It's landing on shorter runways. It's using less fuel. It's cost-effective and it's a pleasure. It's just great fun. You don't have to get to the airport two hours ahead. Get there 10 minutes ahead, put your luggage in the plane, you go. Once you've experienced it, it's tough to go back the other way. In this program, we take a look at some of the flying machines which carry the wealthiest people on the planet between their transcontinental engagements. We meet the man who designs the interiors of some of these flying palaces, fly around the world with TAG Aviation, and catch a sneak preview of the world's first supersonic private jet. For the last five years, the private jet business has been steadily on the rise. Order backlogs are bulging, waiting times have been getting longer, and most importantly, brand new machines from all of the world's biggest manufacturers are coming onto the menu. But clouds have gathered on the horizon. It's very interesting times. Demand is down by 40% globally. Manufacturers are suffering. We've heard about the layoffs. But it's an industry which isn't going to disappear overnight. Total value is about $170 billion and employs hundreds of thousands of people, engineers, designers, total service providers. It's just phenomenal, it really is. We flew into Geneva for the ninth annual eBase show to find out how the movers and shakers in business aviation are responding to the new challenges. Over 400 manufacturers, airlines and brokerage firms are plying their wares at this year's show. And across the road at Geneva's International Airport, the 10,000 attendees were treated to a sprawling apron of 65 new business aircraft, fueled up and ready for takeoff. EBS is a chance for a, a potential owner or an existing owner to see the whole range of aircraft that are available. It's also a good chance to meet the manufacturers Buyers tend to be very low profile, um, it's very discreet, you, know, you wouldn't have no idea that you're standing next to a buyer if you're, uh, if you're you know, walking into an aircraft. Airbus has been in commercial aviation for almost 40 years and today the company employs around 57,000 people across four countries producing over half of the world's jet airliners. The company's private jets are produced by Airbus corporate jetliners, and they've sold more than a hundred of these planes in the 12 years since the sideline began. We make the world's most modern airliners, and we take those airliners and we turn them into corporate jets. If you're going to a G20 summit, you'd better arrive, otherwise your voice is not going to be heard. Our Airbus corporate jet customers are either billionaires or well on the way to becoming billionaires. Naturally, the sort of person who forks out millions of pounds for an aeroplane is liable to be a little fussy. And Chief Cabin Attendant Urs Schenk has seen it all. I'm an old fox into this business, as you can see. And I have grey hair, sometimes also because of this business. You need to have some life experience because you have sometimes very special passengers you would never find uh, somewhere else. So people, they never flew with a regular airline, they know only private aircraft. We are not allowed to give you names, but we fly presidents, we fly royals, and we fly rich families. There are many, many stories. I was planned to have 12 children, 
only children. I organized everything with balloons. I had only comics. I had uh, Big Macs uh, catered and all for kids. And then I got 12 uh, African presidents, you know. And uh, I asked them, uh, would you like to eat uh, this uh, junk food? Or uh, do we have to wait for the catering? And they still remember the junk food. They had so much fun with the comics and everything. And they still remember this flight. Private jets cost money, lots of money. A new one can set you back up to $400 million. It'll cost you $100,000 just to install a shower. The sofa that you're sitting on costs tens of thousands of dollars, not because it's any different than your sofa at home, but it has to withstand all the rigors of flame testing and structural components. An airplane, as you know, flies, and so there is a great deal of business related to the safety of it. So how do these jet setters justify such extravagance? The first guy that showed up with an automobile was a fat cat. Well, no, he was more efficient, he could cover more territory and do more sales. At the top of a multinational company, the chief executive may be getting paid $15 million a year, and it doesn't make sense for that guy to spend hours sitting around an airport. While it's certainly true that owning your own jet is largely the preserve of the mega-rich, enjoying the benefits of business aviation is becoming ever more affordable. Using aircraft has never been so accessible. There are a number of innovative products which have been launched over the last eight to nine years. The fractional model, uh, which is pioneered by a chap called Richard Santuni in the United States, a company called NetJets. What you do is you buy a physical share of an aircraft and the costs are then apportioned amongst a group of buyers and you've got guaranteed availability anywhere in the world. We're one of the largest airlines in the world, but usually beneath the radar, so to speak. Our customers are a, a cross-section of just about everybody out there who uses business aviation. So, of course, corporations, uh, governments, high net worth individuals. There are some celebrities at the very high end of the spectrum, whether it's sports stars or rock and roll stars who use our service. But for the most part, it's just people whose time is very important and who want to save money uh, versus the cost of buying their own aircraft. There are also air taxi operators, uh, Blink in the UK being one. And the idea is that you hop from city to city. Cost per seat is relatively low for the jet market. My business partner and I started this about three years ago when we were doing our MBAs in the United States. And we saw the power of the very light jets as a disruptive technology that's got the power to change how people travel. And so we said, you know what, there's got to be an opportunity here. The idea was, was that if we bought a subfleet of these things and integrated them in, they could put someone who makes less than $50,000 a year of annual salary on one of the planes, and it would save them money. While borrowing someone else's plane is one way to break into the market, nowadays even owning your own is becoming increasingly possible. Honda is possibly more famous for ferrying people about on the road than in the sky, but for three and a half million dollars, they'll sell you one of these a brand new Honda Jet. Aviation has always been a dream for Honda. Our associates love a challenge. We build some of the world's best automobiles and motorcycles and now we're taking to the air with the Honda Jet. Many of our customers are what we call owner-operators. They're people who fly planes themselves. We offer free flight training, and you would come to our facility in the United States. We would train you how to fly the Honda Jet. Uh, this aircraft will be single pilot certified, so an individual would be able to fly the Honda Jet maybe with his family off uh, on a vacation over the weekend, but he could also use it for business during the week. So it's really a great way to travel. You don't have to be a Mick Jagger to fly in a private jet. Traditionally, the so-called Big Five in business jet production has been made up of Cessna, Dassault, Gulfstream, Bombardier, who build the Gates Learjet, and Hawker Beechcraft. And encouragingly, all of these firms currently have at least one new model in development. 
However, Brazilian-based Embraer is rapidly turning the Big Five into a Big Six by adding to their portfolio with this, the 36-meter Lineage 1000, Embraer's largest jet to date. Welcome on board the Lineage 1000 from Embraer. It's a pleasure to have you on board. This is the um, basically the, 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 the place where we prepare the meat and the meals and, and uh, the drinks. The area where we are here right now is an area for the crew where they can rest, they can sit and rest and then go back for their duties later on. This area here is uh, for the passengers where they stay, they have uh, dinner or lunch, they can uh, watch movies. This is the place where people can rest. They can, uh, some aircraft, not this one, not the specific one, have a bed here, a king size bed. And they can uh, even have uh, a shower here uh, when the aircraft is fitted with the equipment, which is not the case for that airplane. You can get this plane for 40, 43 uh, million dollars, so it's a um, 4,500 nautical mile uh, airplane for 19 uh, people and lots of room. The convenience that a business uh, jet provides is, is, is unparalleled. You cannot visit the same amount of places in a given time frame using commercial transport than, than you can do in the, with a business jet. With a 25% share in the traditional market for business jets, American-based Gulfstream Aerospace, part of the General Dynamics Group, are the lords of the top end. Gulfstream builds these aircraft and sells them. The first Gulfstream, the G1, was the first purpose-built business aircraft, a mobile office, a time-saving machine that enables you to work comfortably, but to travel safely, reliably, dependably around the world. Can you imagine not having a cell phone or a BlackBerry in today's environment? For the business person doing business internationally, this is actually a distinct advantage over the guy that's got to fly commercial. The Gulfstream G550, the aircraft that we're currently sitting in, is our top-of-the-line aircraft. The air in this cabin is recycled every 90 seconds. You can use your laptop uh, at 50,000 feet in most places around the world, same speed as you do in your home office. We don't have a show special here, but if you've got $52 million, uh, we'll talk turkey with you right now. Coming up in part two, we meet a designer of private jet interiors and take a look at the fastest business jet in history. London-based designer Andrew Winch has been working out interiors for houses and yachts for 23 years, but in 2003 he was commissioned to design his first aeroplane interior in collaboration with Lufthansa for this towering 737. People enjoy building their own planes because they are uh, very busy people and they like to be in their own environment. They are time poor. We went to visit Andrew at his studio on the edge of the Thames in Barnes, which he had converted from a fire station in 1987. After 23 years of working as a designer, uh, we built this business up, my wife and I and our, my colleagues here now, my four other directors. Uh, we've got 35 people here. We're all designers. We're all in the design industry, all of us. Um, and we're all in, in the business of delivering um, a successful product. <laughs> Designing um, anything for me starts with a discussion with the client. It's always better when it's direct from the guy who's paying the bill, when it's actually talking to them. So I've got no worries about talking kings, queens, sheikhs, uh, industry, oligarchs. I sit here with them at the table, they join me in this room, and within probably an hour and a half, I know exactly what they want. Once we understand the client's um, dream, uh, we will turn that dream into paper drawings. We will take pencils, take crayons, take, take pens and take the computer and we will start to plan uh, with dimensions the whole uh, arrangement of the, of the plane. We'll also look at the fuselage, the livery, 
the embodiment of the design idea. Then there are areas which have structure and you have to attach to certain structure. Uh, there'll be areas that have to have um, weight considerations for the balance of the plane. So we'll turn all of those into drawings. Um, then we'll turn them into 3D sketches with pencil and then we'll turn those into probably CAD illustrations. We'll do uh, watercolour paintings of the interior and then often, uh, like the pictures behind me, we'll turn them into full three-dimensional CAD visualisations. We will create a walkthrough, a one-to-one -one walkthrough of the entire plane where every object in that CAD visualisation has been three-dimensionally drawn from a Coca-Cola can to a new design chair. So we do go to a very, very finite level of detail. I'm delivering their dream back to them and creating the reality. At 80 years old, and with a multitude of business jets, fighter aircraft, rockets, and even conceptual spaceships under its belt, France's own Dassault Aviation have made aviation technology a way of life. It's a uh, close to a century history, so to make it short is difficult. You know, the company was founded by a, a, a genius engineer, Mr. Uh, an entrepreneur, Mr. Marcel Dassault and uh, who started to make himself known in aviation at the very beginning of aviation by creating a propeller that uh, was used on the first fighters during the First World War on the SPAD, which dramatically increased the efficiency of these, uh, these uh, first fighter jets. Altogether, the company produced over 7,000 uh, fighter jets which is quite considerable for a European manufacturer. The Mirage name became known worldwide and contributed to build the image of the company as one of the leading uh, fighter jet manufacturers, mastering uh, technology not only in aerodynamics, but also in system design. If you want to fly at two times the, the speed of sound for a fighter jet, you can't do that if you don't have good aerodynamic engineers. Dassault's 23.5 meter Falcon 7X is the first business jet to make full use of the groundbreaking fly-by-wire technology. Here, redundant computer systems are installed between the pilot and the aeroplane's mechanical surfaces. So if he makes a mistake, his own plane will set him right. We have to be competitive. These, these jets are expensive. In the state, they have a say. Uh, the National Business Aircraft Association, no plane, no gain. So really, a business jet is a profit machine. While technology can doubtless make you more efficient, it can also help simply to enrich the flying experience itself. In October 1977, history was made when a Pan Am Boeing 747SP was flown around the world in a little over 53 hours. Incredibly, the record remained unbroken for more than three decades until November of last year, when a team of pilots from UK-based TAG Aviation decided they'd try it themselves. Corporate aviation probably represents a number of things, and clearly it's a business tool, it's obviously a leisure tool for many people, but it's also fun. It's also something that can, can allow you to, to push the envelope in terms of aviation. Hence, 31 years this record stood. Now we've got aircraft that uh, have the same range um, as a 747, the same speeds virtually as a 747, and yet are small enough and, and nimble enough to, to pull this off. It's one of those records that hadn't been uh, beaten. Uh, like I say, uh, Concorde did, uh, set a lot of records that are completely out of reach, of course, because of the speed. And uh, with this airplane, we managed to beat it, which was not possible you know, with any other airplane before. Although the battle was to be waged in the air, it would be won or lost on the ground. In order to break the record, the team would have to complete each of their five fuel stops in under 40 minutes. But incredibly, the men were back in the air after an average of only 32 minutes, ultimately smashing the 1977 record by almost an hour. The whole thing went like clockwork. I mean, it was absolutely remarkable. We were very, very well organized. 
we had the five pilots, everybody knew when their duty time was on and off. So everybody knew when their rest period was coming. Any time you get on a flight, the chances of you having five flights, uh, one after the other, they're all on time, everybody does their job perfectly, nobody makes a mistake, it's pretty unusual. The highlight for us really was, was bringing it back. I mean, clearly the pilots and the crew had been on the aircraft for 52 hours. We were able to have a party. All the family were there as the aircraft taxied in. We had our fire, uh, fire trucks uh, created a, a, an arch uh, for the aircraft to taxi through. I mean, I, I dream about it all the time. I still find myself once in a while dreaming that, oh, I still have that record to beat, and I wake up and say, no, I've done it. Yeah, so it really is a dream come true. Travelling at 35,000 feet, however, has its drawbacks. We are, by definition, an emitter. We pollute. Carbon emission is quite a topical subject, uh, not just in, in aviation, but across the board, and it's an uh, issue which needs to be addressed. Um, and there has to be some accountability. The flip side to that is obviously that uh, jobs are being created um, and uh, economies are growing because of, uh, of these aircraft. We're very aware of the environment and we do everything we can to improve. That said, aviation is only 2% of the carbon dioxide emissions in the world. So if the world is serious about reducing carbon dioxide, then you need to go where the big generators are, which is essentially the heating of buildings, the cooling of buildings, and cars. Dassault are very, one of the manufacturers I think I could probably highlight. They've been able to reduce uh, emission on, on some of the current aircraft between 25 and 30 percent. EU has some uh, uh, rules which, uh, which are forthcoming. Uh, by 2012, any business aircraft flying over European airspace must have a carbon emission scheme set up in-house. We're not going back to a, a horse and cart society. Innovation, technology um, and crisp, clear thinking combined with good capital initiatives and create great solutions for a modern way of life. In 1911, a farmer from rural Kansas by the name of Clyde Cessna began building small aeroplanes out of wood and fabric and testing them on the vast salt flats of Oklahoma. Nearly a century on, the Cessna Aircraft Company has delivered over 190,000 aeroplanes, more than any other firm in the history of aviation. Cessna's chief executive, Jack Pelton, is a busy man but we caught up with him out on the apron to see what they were up to. We feel that we've taught the world to fly. If you look at the 192,000 airplanes we've delivered in our history, we start at the beginning with the single engine piston airplanes all the way up to the Citation 10 business jet, which is the fastest commercial jet produced today. The quality of the product itself, uh, what we're getting is for the price point, you're getting more features and more benefits, longer range, better speeds, better fuel efficiencies. Over the last 30 years, jet engines have become far more efficient than they were years ago, and each year they continue to get better. So the economics are coming down as the technology comes up. Cessna are a manufacturer which you would probably start off flying with if you're building up your hours and you want to get a license. And Cessna's argument is that uh, once they've got you, they want to trade you up from a propeller to a jet. The idea is that they want to keep you in the family and they've got the range of aircraft to do that. Cessna's Citation 10 business jet is the world's fastest civilian aircraft, promising to take you from New York to Los Angeles in under four hours. The aircraft we're sitting in right now is our Citation 10. It's the flagship of our fleet, our largest aircraft. It travels at 0.92 Mach. The Citation jet range is the sort of Mercedes-Benz of the sky. It's very reliable, very efficient. You could go anywhere in the world and you'll be able to get an aircraft service very, very quickly. This aircraft in the current block that we're selling is uh, approximately $21 million. The only way to go faster is to join the Air Force and fly fighters. You'd have to say then that if time is money, then there's no other plane worth considering. 
Or is there? This is the world's first supersonic private jet. The American firm who've designed it say that when you receive your plane in late 2015, it'll get you from New York to Tokyo in nine and a half hours. And that includes a one hour fuel stop. Provided you've got $90 million, of course. We're going to change jet travel with speed. As we all know, the, the Concorde uh, was, was a beautiful airplane. Uh, it was, of course, no longer available. But the Concorde had certain problems uh, that weren't so obvious in its beauty. And that was, it was uh, good for supersonic uh, travel, but it was very expensive. It burned a lot of fuel for its size, and it could not travel below the speed of sound very efficiently. And it was very poor uh, in terms of airport performance, landing and takeoff. So we have addressed all of those problems as we are equivalent to a subsonic business jet, except that we can also go twice as fast when you need to over long distances. But in five years' time, will anybody be around to buy this incredible machine? The independent research group Teal, based on their current forecasts, uh, looking at the economy approving in, in, for private aviation around 2012. I expect this forecast is, is pretty accurate. Of course, we're, we're in a recession, which is likely to last the next couple of years. A lot of companies are adjusting their balance sheets, and I think we're getting used to a brand new landscape. And once companies are beginning to realize that they need to plan for the next step forward, uh, we'll see uh, the forecasts uh, actually materialize.